in the contraceptive world, this child does not exist. Her chances of existing are... She's the fifth. Fifth child. Yeah, there's no That's way. True, yeah. Everyone bought into it in kind of Western world. Catholics, Christians, obviously non-religious people bought into it big time. So Victoria Gillick, we went to go and interview her recently. And she had noticed there were guidelines and no law surrounding girls of from the age of 12 could go and receive schoolgirl contraception, as they called it, um, from, their, from a doctor or a, a school nurse, but without the knowledge of their parents, oh nor, the GP, nor the family GP. You would go wild. Wouldn't you? As a father and a mother, you'd just go wild if the school was dishing out and you did not know. Yeah, and as a mum of 10 children, she, you know, lots of girls, she wanted to make sure this wasn't going to happen yeah. for her girls. It's so, a completely natural response. Yeah. I've got a friend in there. Should I show you a little friend? There, ah! there he is. Do you him? Welcome to One of Nine. I'm Maria Jones and I'm here with Victoria Gillick. Thank you so much for having us, Victoria. It's a pleasure to meet you. I've got my, my tattiest book that I've had that goes everywhere with me is your book. <laughs> it takes me ages to read a book. Gosh, is that me? Well, <laughs> that's gorgeous. from 35 years ago, I think. Oh. <laughs> this is a very enjoyable book and I feel like I've just met you, but you've been a, a good friend to me. Victoria had 10 children and uh, started out sharing her stories of the swinging 60s. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yes. Hanging off the top of Marble Arch and... <laughs> <laughs> Blowing trumpets on the top of Marble Arch, that's right. That was, I think it was for Oxfam, but generally uh -huh. speaking, it was just students having fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting arrested by the police and taken off in a black Mariah. That's a police van no. to the local Nick. Oh, it was all good fun. We raised... Plenty of money for it. Yes, that's good. And, and so a very enjoyable book. And we go through then when you met Gordon. Yes, I knew him for a long time. So um, when I married when I was 20, just coming up 21. Yeah. Yes. And the wedding um, chats were some of my favourite in the book as well. When you, <laughs> when you spoke about being left at the end of the wedding. Oh, that's right. The two of us. <laughs> Everybody else had beetled off back to our rented house in the middle of the town no. and forgotten us and it was raining and so the two of us just wandered off and sat in the park for a while and when we came in the party was underway <laughs> everybody was having a good time and it was a rented accommodation at the back of a of a shop um, it was completely run down and so there was maybe a bathtub in the kitchen yes there was a bathtub in the kitchen which i never ever used but we had, when we had our first child, Ben used to sit in a little low, um, little low chair in the bath, so that anything he threw on the floor just went into the bath and he washed it down. But the bath itself was used as part of a, a screen printing process. Uh, well, I went to Harrow at first, Harrow Art School, which is where Gordon had been some years earlier, because he's older than me. So what I loved reading was how it was just this romantic... Um, marriage where you just you got married and then you worked all the things out afterwards you know not having to know all about 
how the house was to be dealt with or all those things, you know, you just kind of jumped in. No, that, well, that's right. And even the wedding, right. you know, that people had wandered off and they, it was just... <laughs> it, was, it was right. It was very rapid. Gordon proposed to me and I think... January or February of that year, and we were married in the June. So it was, and I was in Dublin until about the March. So really, we'd only got two or three months to organise it. But nothing much to organise as far as we're concerned. It was going to be an adventure one way or another. Funny, isn't it? It's is funny. And we do see people just crushing themselves with the expense of a wedding. And somehow, just having a Rupert. jolly good time. Put your lovely toy down. Rupert, it's okay, just go through this row here. The adventure. Oh, yeah, the adventure. It was an adventure. We didn't know how it was going to turn out. And yet. then the children started to come. Yes, thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I had five children under five. That included a pair of twins. Um, and then I had, at the end, ten children um, under 14, I think it was, something like that. Wow. Yes, I look, I would, if I looked at um, a mother with all those children now, I would not believe it. But, of course, they didn't all come at once. Look how many pages are folded. <laughs> and actually, one sure. even fell out in the middle, and I was like, oh, no, you must keep that in, sir. I can give you another copy. Can you? Yes, of course. They're not easy to find, you know. Well, no, they were I tried related. to get the one for my sister, and then I, get, yes. I, I got the one that was the letters. I thought, yes. oh, good, I want, I'll have that as well. <laughs> Did you get them off the internet? <laughs> yeah. I think I've got one packet there. Yeah. But uh, it, they were remaindered within about three weeks or a month of being published. W.H. Smith wouldn't advertise them. Told people, no, she hasn't written a book. No, 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 not written a book. And I, that was in the same town that I was living in, in Wisbeach. <laughs> so they just disagreed. This is what the, this is why what's happening now with the sort of cancel culture isn't new. It was in the making yeah. for ye decades before. In fact, you're probably one of the reasons they started. <laughs> they got more <laughs> alert to people like. Well, I was cancelled by the BBC. That's well, why yeah. I stopped going on. Yes. Um, they'd tried to sue me for libel. I'd counterclaimed, they'd lost, I'd won. And, and then we used to be at the Brook Advisory or the FPA or one of those lot, and we'd be on to debate something. Well, then in the end they said, if she's coming on, we're not. And, of course, they were the leading voice, so I'd get dropped so that they could be on. And that happened about three times, and then it was established. How I'm interesting. Not on. They, they mm. couldn't take you on. They wouldn't, no. They didn't like it. I was never on the Today programme, you know, because John Humphreys of Classic FM, as he knows, they didn't like me. So they wouldn't... I mean, the prejudice was immense, no, immense. No. Yeah, people, people couldn't believe that this, li this liberalisation was something to stick your nose up at, and they actually really thought that you were being pessimistic. Here it is. In those days, they were even prepared to countenance such a pessimistic view of modern sexual re relationships in what they truly believed was the f first really enlightened age. To understand why the reaction against the encyclical was so vehement, we have to go back at least a decade earlier to see how the movement towards liberal birth control first took hold of governments and the reason why. I myself didn't fully appreciate its history in this country until I read an article in 1984 in a medical journal called Current Practice. It involved an interview with the ageing Lady Helen Brook, foundress of the chain of birth control clinics known as the Brook Advisory Centres for Young People. According to Lady Brook, it all began in the late 1950s when London Transport launched a recruiting campaign in the West Indies. Come and drive a London bus was the sort of poster that began to spring up all over the Caribbean. It was almost like getting slave labour, said Lady Helen, the wife of, of a successful city businessman. Being a member of the Family Planning Association at the time, she was naturally concerned to note that these Caribbean people often had several children before any wedding ceremony took place and hastened off to the Commonwealth Office, the DHSS, and the Western Indian High Commission to discuss this fact with them all. 
Of course, it wasn't the unmarried nature of these West Indian relationships that bothered people like Lady Brooke, but the higher than average number of children these black immigrants tended to have. After protracted talks with the officials in these three departments, she was given the go-ahead to set a precedent in family planning by making a special case for West Indian couples who were not married. Having succeeded in obtaining this arrangement for dealing with black women, it wasn't very long before Lady Brooke found herself thinking about offering her birth control services to unmarried whites as well and began her policy of open house to all comers. But that was just a spin-off from the original intention, which had been quite clearly a collaborative effort between her staff and the government to reduce the birth rate among black immigrants as a specific group. Nor should it be overlooked who owned the house from which Lady Brooke ran her first clinic in Marlebone, the Eugenics Society. I've got the articles from medical papers um, where she's unashamed she speaks about it. And she had four daughters herself, and she used one of those daughters in the poster for every child a wanted child. It was an adver advertisement for legalising abortion. She used her own daughter and granddaughter in it. Yes, they were not as bad. Yeah, well, were they as bad as they are now? Well, they, they shocked us more because it hadn't been like that. I'm not shocked by anything that I hear now. It doesn't move me at all, because I just think, well, it's a consequence of what came before. What one is capable of as one gets older, as a woman, as a mother, is astonishing. And a mother of 10 at that, Victoria. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there you go, a poster girl for... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but... Um, yeah, I've got... I kept diaries all the time, more like journals, and I cannot believe the amount of of letters I was writing. I don't get, I didn't really type. I am two finger typist. Most of it was handwritten. Um, and I was just working up until one and two in the morning and then having a bit of sleep and getting up again. And who are you writing to, Victoria? Oh, anybody and everybody. Politicians, medical BMA, GMC. Mm -hmm. At one point, I think I had about five different <laughs> tactics to attack. I called myself in the Catholic Who's Who what my hobby was was rat catching. Because I went after Pest it. control. <laughs> exactly so. Exactly so. I thought I would be doing that forever, but it didn't happen. There came a point when I just knew that there was no point because they were so now well entrenched. That was when when Tony Blair came into office and he made the head of sex education for the entire country, the Brook Advisory Centre's um, press officer, the woman who'd had articles writing about, why shouldn't a 15-year-old have sex? You know, she was all in favour of underage sex. Some people get sent to prison for that, others get given a CBE and the head of sex education. So I knew that... There was nowhere else you could go. So I went and it's completely did... completely infiltrated. Yeah, yeah, so I went and we did um, pregnancy counselling for the life charity. Paper and strings, you can have your own set of wings. With your feet on the ground, you're a bird in flight. With your fist holding tight to the string of your kite. Oh, let's... Go fly a kite up to the highest height. Let's go fly a kite and send it soaring up through the atmosphere, up where the air is clear. Oh, let's go fly a kite. A kite needs a proper tail, don't you think? That's what I said, sir. Go fly a kite. No, sir, no. I, I don't mean you personally. Let's go fly a kite up to the highest height. Let's go fly a kite and send it soaring up through the atmosphere.
from 1964, where you're 17, and on the Marble Arch, and having a wonderful time as a student <laughs> and doing all those fun things, Rag Week and all sorts, raising money for charity. Yes. And then 20 years on from that, the Big Brother year, as you named it, the Georgia Orwell, I presume 1984. Yes. Was when a big thing happened um, in that Christmas. So just before that happened, um, we'll introduce to our, our listeners what it was that you were unhappy with initially. So you had this gorgeous gang of children and you're raising children, you've got your mummy. And then you heard about at some point that schoolgirls were going to be allowed to have contraception without parental con That's um, right. consent. Yeah. So it was actually before then, it was 1978. Mm -hmm. And we learned then from a GP, a Catholic GP and a non-Catholic teacher um, in a secondary school, and from Valerie Riches, who ran an organization called Family and Youth Concern, and they had been working on it for years, and get, showed me all these sort of articles and statistics for what was going on, that children under the age of 16, since 1974, have been able to get contraception and an abortion without their parents knowing if that's what the child wanted. It was guidelines that had been issued by the government. It wasn't law, guidelines from the Department of Health when the department took over the running of all the family planning clinics. And it had a sort of, a bit like a car manual for how you dealt with different categories of, of client. Um, one of them was the under 16s. Under 16s couldn't give their consent to even uh, an aspirin at school. You couldn't, a, um, a dentist couldn't put a mirror inside a child's mouth without parental consent. And I think it's the same now. I think I've had to sign yes. something to, yeah, for my daughter to have her antibiotics in school and I have to drop it yes. into the nurse so that they, you know. That's right, yeah. that's right. But on this one issue, the birth control one, different prescription pads were used and the under 16s, no parental consent was necessary. And when those who'd been in this sort of campaigning business far longer than I had um, discovered it, they, they began trying to get petitions up and writing and holding meetings. And parents up and down the country. I mean, I've got mountains of newspaper cuttings that people sent me from around the country, so I knew what was going on, happening in places like Dudley, Birmingham, where special clinics were being opened specifically for the underage. So there you, you know. heard about it, and were very unhappy. Yes, I was. Uh, well, I'd, but maybe you felt like you were joining their army, but somehow you became the front runner. Yes, it was an odd thing. Um, I don't know which way round it came. I think I, I joined the local life group in Ipswich, and there I met one or two people who told me about what was going on in schools and in the clinics and things. And um, I took it from there. We worked a, a big petition to number 10 for what we call parents in Suffolk and all sorts of organizations were involved in it, from the Freemasons down to the sort of Methodist churches. And who you were, who were with you or against you? Well, we'd get the signatures from the Lord Lieutenant or whatever. We got all the top people's signatures, the Bishop of East Anglia or whatever, plus all the local people, and then lobbied the local health authority. And this was specifically to do with the contraception and abortion for schoolgirls? That's right. It's always yeah. only ever been for the under-16s. And um, that got a lot of publicity and a lot of support, media support, tremendous amount of media support. It's only then when we left Suffolk and came to Wisbeach that I wrote to the health authority to see what their policy was. And back came the same old thing. It's for the doctor to decide and the child to decide. And so that was when I took legal advice as to was that lawful? And so what we were doing was challenging the legality of a government diktat, really. And so 
balloon from there. Well, the media really, when they saw that it was a possibility, oh, that was when it got really bad. I lost in the High Court before Mr Justice Wolfe. Went to the Court of Appeal and all three judges found on my side. In and 1984. 84. Yes, that, just two yeah. days before Christmas, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And that's when the media and everybody else started to close ranks. It was serious. It could actually undermine so much of what they'd made their livings out of. This opened a can of worms in law and um, I understand as well, Victoria, to add to that, that from 1066, now you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but from 1066 when this High Court was began by William the Conqueror, there has only been one civilian to represent themselves, and that's you, is that right? I didn't represent myself in the sense that I had lawyers. Um, I'm not sure about that. What I do know is that um, the petitioning Parliament by the use of what's called a public petition, now that had fallen into disuse as a method for changing government policy, oh, for 50, 100 years. And <laughs> and I started that up. I know that because I was approached by um, a, a professor from Durham University who were doing research into public petitions. And the um, petition office at the House of Commons had told them to go to me because I had reawakened it through my MP, who had, didn't support me at all. His name was Clement Freud, grandson of the great Freud. Um, he had told me how to do it. And then he wouldn't support me at all. But it was terrific. It's a petition that comes from every constituency in the country. Using your MP as a, as a what would you call it, as an ambassador or something. Yeah, to take, take, your, take the voices your petition of these petitions. Yeah. Yes. And, and now this is a huge thing. I know, you know, people are online, huge. you can just keep signing petitions all the time. Oh, well, yes, yes. I still think the actual physical petitioning mm -hmm. and signing was a really big thing. It had all these special words um, that had to be used, archaic language. And you could go in there, into the House of Commons, and watch your MP stand up, read it out, and perhaps make some comments, and then the petitions would be taken and put in a sack at the back of the Speaker's chair, Speaker of the House of Commons, and then it would be taken to whichever government minister it was addressed to. It was very, very real. Yes, you can do petitions now, but they're almost ten a penny, aren't they? When this book was published in Spanish, and I went over there to promote it at the invitation of the head of the pro-life in Spain, and they were called Rebeldes con Cosa, Rebels with the cause. Anyway, <laughs> they showed me videos there. I went and gave talks at various different places, schools and universities. And it was when the Spanish government wanted to introduce abortion in the 1980s, this was. And you've got hundreds of students sitting on the ground outside an abortion centre, which was at the base of a big block of flats. And the police just came out in their droves with their great long batons and just beat them into the ground, oh, took them and threw them back the back. They were so brave, the pro-lifers there, I couldn't believe it. And they were so novel in the things that they did, abseiling down the sides of buildings to put up big banners. Um, but they suffered. I always felt that it was a bit like um, what Oscar Wilde was reputed to have said when he was dying. You know, oh, these, these, the wallpaper is killing me. One of us has got to go. <laughs> because when you have something as mad as abortion, destroying your own future, um, that is such a big step backwards. You just know that it's got to go. However they get rid of it, by overlaying it with more positive um, legislation. 
One day I'd taken myself and my upset stomach to a Mason GP and was greeted with what appeared to be his routine question to girl students. Are you on the pill? Insulted beyond words. I never risked going to see him again. Where was all the former juice and joy? This dried up generation seemed to be trying to squeeze the very lifeblood out of youth with all their puritanical rules and regulation and careful pussyfooting. For me and thousands more, life was a great game. All old jeans, sloppy joes and long hair, strumming whimsical Joan Bay's folk songs on cheap guitar in a bedsit and fruit picking in long summer holidays. <sighs> she was before the cultural, the social engineering that we have just been so much surrounded by that people have forgotten that anyone used to be surprised by, <laughs> by being asked, were you on the pill? Now it's just, we sort of feel bad when we're asked or maybe embarrassed or go a bit quiet or shy. To fight off every GP just seems to be far too big a job. So Victoria mentions the Humano Vitae encyclical by Pope Paul VI. Yes, I did have to check my reference. I didn't know how bad. Uh, yeah. Looking back on that encyclical today, 20 years after the event, it seems to me, as to many others, that it had all the hallmarks of a work of prophetic vision. At the time, however, it was almost universally cast... Sorry. Castigate. Castrated. No, it isn't. <laughs> I thought it was there. <laughs> At the time, however, it was almost universally castigated as the uninspired outpourings of an interfering reactionary misogynist. Could the youngsters in the 1980s even imagine what it would be like to be a teenager in the 60s when birth control and women's sexual emancipation was avant-garde news everywhere, and then to hear this lonely male voice from afar denying the very basis of that revolution, a voice saying that man who grew accustomed to the use of contraceptives might in the end lose respect for his wife and no longer care about her physical and emotional well-being, and who might come to consider her as mere instrument of selfish enjoyment instead of respected and best loved companion. Few people in those days were even prepared to countenance such a pessimistic view of modern sexual relationships in what they truly believed was the first really enlightened age. To understand why the reaction against that encyclical was so vehement, we have to go back at least a decade earlier to see how the movement towards liberal birth control first took hold of governments and the reason why. Careful with your lovely baby girl, and you don't have to carry her around. Why don't you pop her in the hospital and give her some medicine? I won't carry her. Well, you, you can. Remember, you've got to hold one hand on her bottom. Can and one I hand put this around her? Oh, thank you. She must be getting cold now. If I tie that round her, <coughs> then she's got a little shawl. That'd be nice. She's a little old lady. <coughs> Hello, little old lady. I think you've got a little illustration in the book like this. Hello. I'm a little old lady. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> So, 1984, big surprise, uh, win. Yes. The two days before Christmas. Yes. Were the three lords, were they lords? Yeah. The judges had voted in your favour. Yes. My baby. Evely, Fox yeah. and Parker. That. The Department of Health appealed against that ruling um, to what was called the House of Lords then. It's now called the Supreme Court. And then I was up before five judges and I was told by the one of the ushers there that this was the longest case that had been heard because I think it lasted a fortnight for 40 years um, it was a very serious case and was this when you realized that it opened a kind of, a kind of can of worms really for medical law that had been left to just this guideline and for the schoolgirl contraception, but then they've used it now for a whole host of things. At the time, that they were, they were going to argue that disaster would happen. Uh, pregnancy, teenage pregnancy rates would rocket, abortions would rocket. Um, there were television programmes, endless weekly, daily articles being written. For fear that the parents would disagree with the child having the contraception. And that's what they were saying. They were saying that there would there'd be increased numbers because well, if we asked the parents, then the parents wouldn't allow them to have contraception. Oh, they didn't, parents didn't come into it. It was, what would the girls do? I argued, if you think that 15-year-olds, 14-year-olds are mature enough to have a say in their own sexual re relationships and old enough to give consent to contraception, 
And why do you think they're so stupid when they can't get a hold of contraception to go ahead and put themselves at risk? I argue they won't. You know, thinking of myself and, and other girls, they won't they'll use their nows and they'll either use another method or they'll abstain. And nobody listened to that. Obviously, it was the wrong, the wrong argument. The only argument was girls are mature, girls are stupid. <laughs> it was there was no logic in it, but there was huge vested interests in in providing contraception um, to the young. I mean, it, it's like big pharma, big pharmaceuticals now. There's just an awful lot had been invested in it. And a lot of people were making a lot, a lot of money out of it. And I don't know, something very perverse. They've gone down and down the age groups at, at which they, they want to corrupt, basically. If it's a, an innocent period of a child's life, we'll corrupt it by saying you need to know more. You're ignorant. Um, you need to have all this ignorance dispelled. And now and I think they start at age four and five. Yes, exactly so. They keep going down. But I had always argued, look, the only children who are at risk here are the children where the parents don't care whether they're on the pill or not. They generally don't care, and those children are at risk. They're either in local authority care or they're in neglectful homes. But the parents who do care, those are the ones you're undermining. Um, because their children are going wayward at a particular time, but the parents are not bad. Anyway, what seems to have happened is after I lost the case in the House of Lords, and it affected the law on everything to do with um, girls under 18 and mm -hmm. under 16, it, it affected divorce proceedings, which, child, which oh. parent would the child choose to go to, um, where you had anorexia and the child was refusing to eat, could they force feed them? Under 16s, well, they can make their own choice. Um, police, teachers, social workers, everything was touched by this ruling from the majority in the House of Lords. But within five years of And that, that final ruling, there was a, it was the, the five Lords voted three to two. After the ruling, I didn't let it lie. I said, well, um, the, the leading judge, Lord Fraser, had said that there must be a, a set of criteria that a doctor will apply to see if he can avoid talking to the parents. You know, the final one being the catch-all, that if the child says, we're not telling the parents, then you'll have to judge, well, is she going to get herself pregnant or not? And that... I kept challenging and saying, well, if that is the law, then anything that, any clinic that sets out to actually undermine that by saying, we never tell parents, children, you can come here, we will never tell parents. They were breaking the law. So I would keep reporting some of these doctors, they weren't GPs, they were clinic doctors, to the General Medical Council. I did that over and over again and they just became more and more adamant that they weren't going to inform not just parents they weren't informing the gp the social worker for those girls that were in care homes the police if the child was under 13 and was clearly being abused they wouldn't inform anybody and lo and behold when these cases of serious abuse cases came up of, of these gang rapes um, all over the country. They had started operating about five years after I lost my case because they were able to take the girls that they were grooming and drugging, they would get them on the pill or if they got pregnant, they would take them to the clinic and get an abortion arranged. And I nobody was being told. And m the majority of them were children from care homes, where the police and the care homes said, oh, well, they're making a lifestyle choice. You know, um, this is what these girls want to do. And everybody says... You
these were being neglected. And I, I got the serious case refused from two of them, one from Newcastle, and they mentioned the Gillett case and saying there's got to be a national debate about this again because the, the, the medical profession is now unwittingly helping the perpetrators to abuse children. Was the church supportive of your case? The Catholic Church? Oh, well, Catholics themselves were, yes. The laity and a large body of the priests, but some of the bishops, particularly up at the hierarchy, the top of the hierarchy, didn't want to fall out with government ministers. They were sitting at the top table and they didn't want to be thought as medievalists, you know. Oh, I don't believe in that. I had that. I had that. I was described as a Roman Catholic mother of ten. That was how I was introduced in the newspapers, on every television programme. In fact, I got so fed up with it um, on one programme in which there was a couple of agony aunts, Mary Kenny, um, other people, and Mama, and they'd introduced me as, you know, Roman Catholic mother of ten. I said, hold on a second, this was with an audience. If it's so important what my religion is, can we hear what the religion of everybody else on this panel is? And so Mary Kenny was quite happy to say she was a Roman Catholic. And they got to, uh, not Claire Rayner, Claire Rayner, no, it was another one who happens to be Jewish, like most of the agony aunts are. And she's atheist. And she was saying, I have a very deep, deep, deep. And she was getting deeper and deeper and down. <laughs> I was laughing by this time. They never asked me, they never mentioned it again, that I was a Roman Catholic mother of ten. <laughs> because you can forget about religion. Your argument just stood, you know, I mean, religion... Well, it, it just it showed up their on. prejudice. It, it, yeah. They were bigoted. Yeah. They were calling me a Roman Catholic, and I had a lot of children. And they were trying maybe to, to pin it down just to being a religious view rather than it being something that is for everybody, I, for I, all I, I young wasn't girls. I, I didn't yeah. take it as a religious. I had to kick and fight against this. Um, in the end, I realised that, well, actually, I might as well say it, you know, what I'm, I'm being kind of. But I was went to huge lengths to hide the fact that I was a Catholic because I knew what they would label me. In the end, I, I was, I think, I was happy enough to say, um, yes, I am a Catholic. <laughs> what are you, what are you going to make of it? Sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, one becomes a bit more punchy there. I, mean, I was in the House of Lords, where I'd been to see a, a member of the House of Lords, and one of the noble chaps took me aside and said. You know you would have got a great deal more support if you hadn't been a Catholic or had so many children. And I said, but that's what the majority of people are like. Why hasn't anybody else done it? People who aren't Catholic and don't have lots of children, they could have taken this case. Why didn't they? Your lovely brother. So there we go. Um, that really did rile me up. I thought, oh, glory be. <laughs> what was it? card I sent to one of my daughters recently, picture of um, the suffragette on the front of it. What was her name? A Pankhurst. It said, uh, 105 years of the vote and it was still being led by idiots. <laughs>
And now this is known, this, this piece of legislation is known as Gillick competency. That's right, Gillick competency. And then in medical schools and nurses and doctors yes. will all be trained on the Gillick competence. Yes. And it, but they've used your name, Gillick, yes. for something you were fighting against. Well, yes, absolutely. How did you feel about that? It was, was, that, it was that what they told you at the time that was going to happen? This, this is now going to be called the Gillick competence? Or is this something that's sort of been uh, known the end as? of the Law Lords ruling, as I think I mentioned in the book, on the steps of the Law Lords, I said, this is a chart of a men to abuse and harm young girls. And it's exactly what it was. It was what it turned out to be. Um, that's exactly what happened. But I could never have dreamed that that would have happened in the way it did. Don't think anybody could. Just thought it was a, a general, steady policy of neglect of the young. Um, and then came the sort of whole sex education thing, thanks to the Brooks and Tony Blair's government. He just promoted and promoted it. and. They now claim, ah, oh, well, you see, we got the pregnancy rates down. Well, yes, you did. By what means? Yeah. By whilst the abortion rates have gone skyrocketing. Yes, it's 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 not so much the surgical ones; it's the chemical ones. That's why the Life Group, the Life Charity, that I was a part of, and was running Life and was running pregnancy counselling centres. They all closed down in there yeah. because the girls could get the morning after pill from chemists yeah. as quickly as that. So they've used Gillick competence, they've used your name all over the, the country and all, all within yes. these, these places where it has implications, particularly in the medical field. You know, that's taken your name. There's, there's a, a big weight that was on your family then. Yes, for a certain your... number of years. But over time, but over time, people now recognise my children's names, and there's no abuse. In fact, you know, there's so many um, people changed their minds about that, uh, who were 15, 16 year old girls at the time, and now they are in their 40s and have got 15 year olds themselves, and 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 realised what I was, what I was saying is true. And anyway. This isn't just confined to England. Mm. I mean, I got journalists coming to me from South America, from France, from Germany, from Australia, all over Europe, and all saying to me, but during the court cases, don't know what you're getting upset about. We've been doing this for years. It was a policy since 1974, and the year of the child, that was when they made a dead set against children. You also have another book that I have, um, Dear Mrs Gillick, The Public Respond. <laughs> you won't find that anywhere. <laughs> Actually, I got, that one, I got that one when I was trying to order this one for my sister. <laughs> I got this one. That's yeah. another lovely book. And then somebody else in our era now, she's now, she's, you know, from the secular world, and um, Victoria, no, Louise Perry, she has written The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. She, I felt like when I was reading your book, we come across her, and you spoke about Pope Paul the Sick, and you had all this evidence, you know, of the 20 years that it, it had happened, and now she is writing um, 60 years on, mm. and she has gathered data. Oh. It's the data that speaks for itself of what you were saying at the time. Oh, right. Pope Paul uh, the Sick that it had really? predicted in his encyclical oh, Humanae Vitae. Yes. And you refer to that several times in your book. And she doesn't refer to, to you or, or the Pope. She just purely uses all the data that women are the victims of this sexual revolution. Well, of course And she are. makes this case against it. And she actually says that the uh, feminist proposition, the best, the best feminist pro proposition, is marriage. <laughs> at the end really? of all of that. God. At the Oxford Union <laughs> debate on the day after I lost in the House of Lords, who was I with? Germaine Greer, and she was supposed to be opposing me on a motion to do with feminism or something like that. Um, and they brought up my case, and she crossed the floor, and she supported me. In fact, when we were we were getting dressed um, to do this whole debate, we stood back to back and sang 
Sisters, sisters, never were the such devoted sisters. <laughs> These are the ones in 1999. You said your, your father got copy yes. of my book, 1999. Uh-huh. I wondered if he got him... HLI. In HLI, yes, Human Life International. And one in London, one in Dublin. Life National Conference, yes. East Anglia Life. And GP have- Registrar's training. Uh-huh. He wouldn't have been there. Well, he is a GP Registrar's. And Spuck Merseyside, Human Life International again. Yeah, yeah. Lots of opportunities in 99 that he could have got your... Yes, it was a busy so- year, that. Did you write all your speeches down and keep them and yes. you catalogue them all? Yes. This is number seven speeches. Um, um, I've got another one somewhere. And articles then this is where you have articles, articles. yeah, by or on Gillick. There's the court rulings themselves. There's a public Hello. petition. Hello. I mean, you get something like articles on Gillick. <laughs> a mixed bag of reviews <laughs> then. Yeah. Mummy, Ethics and medicine. Um, yeah, you look into the me Lancet, minute, I want to hear. Um, from the big debate, some magazine or other. Sunday Express. Um, Here you it are. It was going on all the time. Faye what news. Well, this was, what date is it? Ni- 1989. She's probably not March. been born. <laughs> but, um, yeah. You see a mother's tale free from the free a thinker. Tale, the thing. lovely book. This is from Chic. I'd never heard of them. I said, Chic. This is from. <laughs> I think this is the abortion Daddy law. Mom. These are the Lord Young, Victoria Gillick. That's Mediscope. It's still it's wide variety. That's a that's a, a Christian magazine, Christian organisation. Ten children and a cause. There you are. Oh, that's in Arabic. Interesting. Table. So it opens backwards. Oh, oh we got the, this lovely. Oh, my arms break. So, Ruby, get the baba and show the. So you, you, you read it from this direction. Yes, it is, Ruby. It is. They came took some terrific photographs. <laughs> is it she here? Yes, it was me then. Was Making do, your bread you were, in your army you tin. Yes. Yes, so that's, that's how it goes backwards. So they were very interested. Obviously, they're Islamic, they're Muslims. When I told the Guardian journalist, you know, that, well, Mr. Said, whatever it is, he said, well, they would, wouldn't they? They're all right wing. I mean, they were very outspoken. They hated me and they hated Muslims. Um, but I, you know, I got a petition by. All the leading, I think it's in the book, all the leading religious leaders. Uh, and including yeah. ethnic oh, yes. religious leaders. Yes. Um, the most difficult one, well, not the Methodists, they would never sign. Um, Why would they not? What was I don't know, they, were, they were just very, very liberal. Just very liberal. Anything, they sort of, anything that was legal must be moral. Before it was legalised, they wouldn't have touched it with a barge pole. But because it's been legalised, they've suddenly become very virtuous about it. But they're mixing up this idea that if the law makes it OK, then it must be OK. The government itself, the, the judges, like Mr Justice Scarman, who said that giving contraceptives to the under-16s was just another step in women's liberation, emancipation, and all the rest of it. He didn't believe that a few years later, but by then he wasn't a judge anymore. Yes, it's a, um, I think Catholics are very, very clear-sighted about the consequences of bad actions. They go on, on generationally, and there's virtually nothing you can do to stop them, except... You have to. You have to stand up and do your best. You know, what did I what did you do in the war, Daddy? I tried. I may have failed, but I tried. And that's all I felt. And it it was I thought at one point we were going to actually win this. We thought the law would come down on our side. But unfortunately you go to when you go to law when you go to court, you don't get justice, you just get law. And that's a, a game in itself. 
and the best lawyers win it. After this, Victoria, you mentioned earlier as well about seeing the, the consequence of it because you worked for 17 years, was it, with life and counselled young... Yes, as a pregnancy, pregnancy counsellor and in the life charity shop. And some of the cases were really tragic and really shocking, you know, of 13-year-old girls who God had, for some reason or other, made them look 18-year-olds. Sophisticated, beautifully dressed, tall, beautiful. And yet they had got the actual mentality of an 11-year-old. But they were 13. And they were being uh, abused by young men in their 20s. The way that they were, the, the sex education in some of the schools was um, so close to grooming, so close to grooming. It, they, one had a, a school nurse who did it and who called it their quality sex time. For all underage girls, I, I don't know, but it will swing back the other way, I don't doubt in time. But the harm that's done along the way, uh, we, you just have to um, wait for a ch I don't know. I, I have no answer to it because one can sort of see it coming. My, my, my husband, my sister and her husband, the three of, three of us were Catholics and it was we just knew that what they called in the 60s the permissive society, there was a slippery slope it was on, and it would go from one thing to another thing to another thing, that they would end up with euthanasia. Everybody said, no, 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 you're daft. You, that's not true, it won't do that. But it has, because unfortunately, human nature being frail and fallen, um, it, you have to fight to be good, really. <laughs> you can't just hope the best. It is an, a ver an age of great neglect. I think if you dismiss mothers as of really any significant importance in a society, then you dismiss children too. It's all part and parcel of the same thing. Their role is, is undermined, and their role is to bring up children, the next generation. And they have so undermined mothers that the COVID brought out the fact, the lockdown, is that an awful lot of parents just didn't know how to bring, you know, even talk to their children. And when they weren't at school, they just weren't being talked to. I'm not usually very negative about these things, but I just know that there are so many, many good families around that even if they are a remnant <laughs> of common sense, they will prevail. It will happen that way. Yeah, and you spoke about that in your book as well. You're conscious that you don't want just to be seen as, you know, being negative or putting that onto you. But this, you know, this was to protect what was so beautiful and joyful and, and as you said, your, your gorgeous little family life. And what, what was it that you enjoyed most about being a mum, Victoria? What sort of memories do you remember? You think, oh, that was lovely. Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't say it, it, it extended over so many decades. I seem to have been a mother, you know, well into my 60s. I can't remember. <laughs> I just liked the You'll whole have to read of it. your book again. <laughs> yes, I just liked it. I, I thought, to, I used to say, when I was an older mother, to younger mothers who were struggling, if you're not enjoying it, you're not doing it right. It shouldn't be painful. Um, you should be having some fun with these children. And I did used to have fun with them. I found, I found children very funny. They used to make me laugh, taking them in, in, a, in a great big pram, a twin pram, silver cross twin pram, so hoods on both ends, right into the middle. Fit four little children in there, and we'd go off scrumping. <laughs> for apples and pears. That's so lovely. And put them all in the basket. Through the well, countryside, yeah. yeah. And, and seeing one of, one of your children walking down, you know, between the hedgerows and his 
trouser pockets are so packed with fallen apples that they pulled them off with oh. on his legs. Oh. oh, they're all full of those lovely things. When I am old and grey and full of sleep, I hope my memory does not fail me to such a degree that I forget all these endearing and enduring things about the big family we have raised. If I should only recall the troubles and burdens of our parenthood, then I shall indeed have forgotten not merely the best bits of the adventure, but the essential truths of it as well. <laughs> For a bigger than average family brings... <laughs> Are you singing along? For a bigger than average family brings so many immeasurable joys to every member of it, from their birth to their independence and way, way beyond. Oh, I agree with that. <laughs> Victoria, thank you so much for talking to us today. It's been a joy to meet you. I feel like we have been best friends for a long time now. That we've had the magic book. <laughs> um, thank you so much, you and Gordon. And it's a pleasure. Wonderful to meet you. God bless you. <laughs> So I do on the channel when we like to, where possible, reclaim great poetry and pop culture. Which might point to the good, the true and the beautiful. That kind of celebrates our Christian outlook. Uh, and in one of the James Bonds, they did, they read, Judy Dench read a poem called Ulysses, which, which did really well, you know, James Bond out there, soldiering on, taking on the bad guys. By Tennyson. By Tennyson. To celebrate all these, let's say, senior couples that would recently be doing the Buscombs and... The McFarlane Barrows. The McFarlane Barrows and the Gillicks. All three families got a great legacy, left a great legacy, leaving a great legacy. Created a great legacy. Created a great legacy, <laughs> all those things. But they themselves can no longer have children. And that is represented in the line that's really what you've got to buy into. Daddy's interpretation of it. We are not now that which in days of old moved heaven and earth. And moving earth is mummy and daddy doing their bit to create children. And heaven is that tiny little life getting a soul and a spirit and all those good things. And being breathed life into. Breathed life into by the Almighty. You know, in the kind of post Christian world now, we chuck our parents off into old people's homes and Euthanasia is always a subject, you know, once you've passed your usefulness, mm. what's to be done with you? So oh. awful. J Judy Dench reads it so well, Mummy, I had to go with the James Bond music. I found other people reading, but it's just too pompous. So here we are. Just one more thing to say. Just one more thing to say. My late husband was a great lover of poetry. And um, I suppose some of it sunk in, despite my best intentions. And here today, I remember this, I think, from Tennyson. We are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven. That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield.